as 2002 comes to a close and 2023 begins. 2023? We're in an entertainment dead zone where you've got time to watch some stuff. Now, a couple of shows aren't dropping. They're starting, but they're week-to-week releases. You know, you need a good binge. And I've got some for you. Now, you might be saying, Grace, it's one thing to catch up on a movie for award season, but do you really think I should go back and watch a show from several months ago? Yes, I do. Because a number of these shows have been renewed and their new seasons are going to be fire. And you don't want to have to be catching up at the last minute, do you? You know, being like, I should have done what Grace said. Now I'm behind. Catch up now while you have some time so you can hit the ground running with these new seasons. And I'll even tell you which shows have been renewed. Most of them have, because this is great television. Uh, On that note, there were so many good shows in 2022 that instead of a worst list, and come on, are there really any horrible shows from this year? Simmer down, She-Hulk haters, simmer down. Although to be fair, there isn't a single Marvel show in my top 10 and only one made it in to my top 20. That's right. I'm doing a runner-up best list, so overall I'm recommending 20 shows to you today. And there are still some shows that didn't even make my list, even with 20, because 2022 was competitive for streaming. So without further ado, let's get to my top 10 in this video, and be sure to share your own lists down below. You're going to find you probably need 20 spots as well. Whew, such good television. That's why movies are having a problem. All right, 10. Andor. That's why it just squeaked by under the top 10. Because when Andor was good, it was really good. I'm talking episode, the beginning of episode one, I would say, and then six through 10. That was, you don't get better than that. Uh, who will ever forget Andy Serkis's Kino Loy? That's all I'll say, because I'm trying to make these as spoiler free as possible. Because some of you might not have watched this stuff. Or Stellan Skarsgård's instantly iconic speech about rebellion. You're like, wow. It's if 50% boring, and really 50%, if 50% boring is the price we have to pay to elevate Disney Plus content, I'm willing to pay that price. Because Disney Plus is becoming a factory of IP shows. And after that first brilliant year, I mean, it started out so strong, that factoriness is really starting to show. And to get here, uh, 12 episodes instead of six, that episode, that six episode garbage, Again, if half of them, half the 12 episodes don't even work, I don't care. Because at least I didn't feel cheated, which is so often the case with just six episodes. You're like, come on, you clearly don't have enough room to do anything here. Of note. So yeah, Star Wars is still on shaky ground, still finding its legs, but this is definitely the way. Oh, it's great. I mean, I still like The Mandalorian too, like Dave Filoni kind of like building out. I think Dave Filoni and Tony Gilroy, Tony Gilroy needs some help though. He really has a problem making his stuff commercial. So maybe they could talk to each other, but you know, Dave Filoni's good. I'm not worried about Dave Filoni. And I think Tony Gilroy has really great ideas, but you can't leave Tony Gilroy alone. (laughs) Is that one of those creatives where you can be like, see you when you come back with your finished product? You have to be like, I want to, I need someone, someone needs to hold your hand, Tony. Uh, All right, number nine, I know that's going to upset some of you so much, but look at Andor's low viewership numbers. I mean, those are a problem. Uh, Number nine, when, you know, some of you might be like, oh, it's not all about viewership or box office. If you want something to be big budget, it is, and Andor is not a cheap show, which was part of what was so great about it. They had so many locations and everything looked gorgeous and they shot on location, which is expensive. So if you want Tony Gilroy to be able to continue to deliver this kind of Star Warsy goodness, he's got to get more viewers. All right, number nine, that's a pet peeve of mine. All right, number nine. Wednesday. Wednesday does not have this problem. Wednesday is a ratings juggernaut. But didn't I say in my review before Wednesday Mania, uh, that before that hit, that Jenna Ortega's performance was a, was a star turn and that her dance scene, I shouted that out specifically. I said, that is a real gem. If you don't love that performance until that point in episode three, that's when you'll fall in love with the character. And what do you know? A star has indeed been born and that dance scene is now iconic and legendary with the behind the scenes story that she actually had COVID when she shot it and was waiting for her test results to come back. Uh, Wednesday manages to get its goth on and still be quite wholesome at the same time. And I believe that's why, in large part, it has such a huge audience, because it has that four-quadrant appeal. Wednesday has been reimagined as a goth Pollyanna or goth Nancy Drew. Take your pick, a little of both, maybe. 
Uh, add to that a classic love triangle and her very own Bucky, complete with fans shipping them, and Catherine Zeta-Jones and her best Rolson Zaro. I mean, Wednesday was very well built for success and has found it. Huge hit. Huge. One of the biggest, I think it's like right behind Stranger Things now. It goes Squid Game, Stranger Things 4, and Wednesday. And I got to tell you, that list makes sense to me. Uh, eight, The Crown, season five. I know The Crown isn't for everyone, but it's for me. I love this show. Personally, I find the show to be quite fair, uh, showing the good and the bad of everybody. And I am always impressed when someone can do that. And it manages to accomplish that going over Charles and Diana. That's truly impressive that it's able to stay impartial. Also, like the best season of American Crime Story, the show never was as good as that first season. The Crown is also able to highlight how these real world, of, these real events set the tone, were precursors to things we find ourselves dealing with today. It's like, here's their origin story. It's fascinating for someone like myself who really likes history. Uh, I also love the dynamics of both business and family, and the crown, like succession, delivers both. I mean, the royal family even calls themselves the firm. And sometimes people have a problem adjusting to the royal family because they don't, aren't willing to accept the fact that it runs itself like a business. Every season, this show tops itself. You know, not just the writing, but the performances, and also a lot of the, um, the directing and the production values. They had some great shots this season. I mean, every season it tops itself every season without fail. Number seven, Winning Time. Speaking of a family business, Winning Time tells the story of the Bus family, the Lakers dynasty from the very beginning. And by the way, it was surreal to see Jeannie Bus in the headlines just the other day getting engaged to Jay Moore after seeing her depicted on this show as an intern on the team her dad had just bought, which she, if now, she of course now has come to run. And she has very much turned into her father and actually ended up picking, well, she's she's been in really high profile relationships before, but with Jay Moore, he actually has a lot of Jerry Buss vibes himself. So I find that all fascinating. Uh, but Winning Time isn't just the story of the Lakers, it's the story of how basketball was able to surpass baseball, and I believe also football, to become a hugely popular spectator sport. Until this, period that this show is depicting, people didn't want to watch basketball. It wasn't that big a deal. So not only did things change from a business perspective, they show you how that stuff was changed, but the game itself was changed. You know, the way they played it, not only to be more effective as a team, but to increase the entertainment value of watching the game. I mean, that's amazing to me. My God, I love seeing that. To see how it was not an accident. That's amazing to me. And all of that is highlighted by a great script, great performances, and amazing directing, including getting right into the middle of these games. I've seen football filmed very well, and uh, even baseball to some degree, but I've never really seen, seen someone film basketball like this, and it's so cool. And of course, there are the big players you would expect in a story like this, but how about this is also where Pat Riley got his start. You see him slick his hair back for the first time. Or Paula Abdul. She doesn't really factor into the first season, but I think she'll be a big part of season two because she was a huge part of the Lakers becoming such a big deal and it launched her career. Just like The Crown and American Crime Story, like I was just saying, you get to see that first spark of so many things that today are woven deeply into our culture. And here you see how it all connects, where it came from, and that it was like intentional. It's like a bunch of friends who were friends in college and they went out into the world and business and spread out. And you're like, oh, look where it's, it's began. It's like that. It's so, it's so interesting. Uh, number six, The Boys season three. Ah, Marvel couldn't get onto this list, but The Boys did. After getting used to watching this show as a weekly with season two, that was brutal. That was tough. But we had to go through that pain for season three, where the boys was finally able to become appointment television because of the weekly release. Ah, so worth it when you look back and, and considering where we are now. Speaking of star turns, Anthony Starr's Homelander just keeps getting better and better and better. Just when you think he couldn't possibly top himself, he gets another deliciously juicy scene that he just really knows how to run with. He's starting to get some award nominations, and when he gets an Emmy nomination, which I think he will one day, maybe not this year, but maybe with season four, that's when the show, you'll know that it's truly arrived. 
I think he's working his way towards one. The Boys started out, even as a comic, as a lampoon slash commentary on superhero stories. And it still is, but it's so good that it has become as popular as the superheroes it's parodying. And it's a universe of its own. DC and Marvel might try to go dark, but they'll never be able to cut as deep as the boys. And that's why the boys, in terms of that darkness, will always be a step at the head of the competition and what makes it so unique as a franchise. And as the mythos deepens, it just wants, leaves us wanting more. I'm so excited for season four. Uh, number five, Stranger Things 4. Stranger Things is so popular these days, James Cameron is even starting to take pot shots at it. But that's okay. Let him hate. He's just nervous because Stranger Things has indeed become movie-level entertainment. Uh, he was saying that the cast is, and you know, it's not like it. I think I'm still buying them as high schoolers. I mean, people in their 20s and sometimes even their 30s have a long history of playing high schoolers in Hollywood. We're used to it. Uh, but Stranger Things has indeed, as I said, become movie-level entertainment, thanks to a fourth season where every episode was its own movie. It was such a thrill for Netflix to basically drop seven movies. I mean, it was amazing. It was as if at the MCU dropped seven movies at one time. I mean, it was just incredible. And then another two movies with part two. And Eleven finally got a villain worthy of her with the amazing, captivating performance by Jamie Campbell Bower, whose identity had so many layers, it kept all of us guessing until the very final reveal. Everybody wants to be the next Steven Spielberg. Hello, Mr. Lens Flare. But nobody has come as close as the Duffer Brothers. I'm very curious, after this upcoming fifth and final season, what happens to them? Will they be snatched up by, will they go to the, even the movie level or will they stick to streaming? Will a franchise, you know, snatch them up or will they do their own thing? I'm very, I think they'll definitely be able to write their own ticket. Number four, the White Lotus. I know it's so high. This might be a little bit because it just wrapped, but is it? I mean, you know what beats seven movies dropping all at once? How about HBO's Sunday night appointment television, where we all watch together and then discuss it in one big weekly party? Uh, it's hard to top that, as you'll see from the rest of this list. It seemed the first White Lotus couldn't be topped and with a ton has a ton of awards, raising the bar quite high. But then to evolve the show into a murder mystery, brilliant. And to go from a commentary on wealth to, well, let's say intimate relations, that just broadened the appeal of the, of the show. That was a really smart idea. And while the first season cast was great, here Mike White brought in several fan favorites and gave them juicy, very adult roles that those fans could really sink their teeth into. You know, he picked, you know, he picked, you know, people who I think, you know, had been like more like in tween and teen stuff to a degree. Uh, and then, you know, elevated them to, again, as I said, an adult performance. And I think that also helped the season really pop. Plus, wow, Jennifer Coolidge, Meme Machine, and maybe Emmy Machine. Number three, The Offer. If you're watching my videos, you too would enjoy The Offer if you haven't already. Sure, it's probably too inside baseball for a lot of people, but never has there been, never, and I mean that, a more accurate depiction of what it's actually like to make a movie. At all the different levels, from the talent on the ground, uh, in front of and behind the camera, to the studio head, to the suits that run the company that owns the studio, they got it all. Matthew Good as Robert Evans, you don't get better performances than this. Uh, like the movies that Evans produced, this role has it all, baby. Oh, I loved it. They went to all the restaurants everybody still goes to in Hollywood. It was all there. It was all there. And if you thought the Godfather references in The White Lotus were fun, it's funny how we're all on the same page to some degree, um, here you get to find out how all those iconic scenes were conceived and executed. It's the ultimate behind the scenes, plus all the drama of a scripted show, yet it's all still very accurate. Uh, oh, so good. It's got a little Mad Men thrown in there because of the time period. Oh, it's a must watch. And thankfully now on iTunes, as well as still on Paramount+. Plus. Oh, if you haven't seen the offer, you gotta watch it. Uh, two, House of the Dragon. Talk about Sunday night appointment television. Uh, after the horrible final season of Game of Thrones and a series finale so bad, fans not only swore they were over Game of Thrones, but it ruined the careers of Benioff and Weiss. House of the Dragon is so good that we all instantly found ourselves back in. Benioff and Weiss are still not, are still out in the cold, uh, but Game of Thrones itself, we're all back in. Matt Smith delivered the star wattage he was supposed to, and the whole cast is stellar, just like the first Game of Thrones. But the real MVP, the heart of the first season, is Patty Considine's King, King Viserys, which is why his snubs so far for awards have fans gutted and nervous for the upcoming awards that are still to come. If he doesn't get an Emmy nomination, we riot. 
Seriously, you haven't wa- if you haven't watched his character arc from buffoon that we all laughed at to everyone's favorite dad, we were all like, don't you touch him. You are missing out. Wow. And that, it's like, it's, it's one of the best tr- character arcs ever. It, and it's all setting up the Dance of the Dragons for the very next season, a.k.a. Dragon Civil War. Uh, the, season fina- the, series fi- uh, the season finale this time, very good ending. Then finally, the best show of 2022 is Severance. And if you haven't watched Severance, you're probably like, seriously, Grace? But if you have watched Severance, you know that's a bullseye. That's a bullseye number one. Uh, from Ben freaking Stiller, Severance is top-notch science fiction. Think Ray Bradbury, think B- uh, Black Mirror. The show is an incredible slow burn, but what added to the fun of the weekly release on Apple TV was that nobody was watching the show. So each week you were like discovering gold. You were like, wow, this is so good. I can't believe nobody's watching it. Wow, there's no one to talk to about this. It's so good, I'm going crazy. But oh, it's popular now. When uh, when Severance showed up at Comic-Con, they packed their room. So make sure you're ready for season two. Talk about hitting the ground running. This is the show you must be ready for. Because uh, especially after the season one finale, they positioned themselves beautifully for season two. The season one finale was one of the most intense, shocking, edge of the seat experiences I've ever had. I was shouting at my TV. It was incredible. Ben Stiller, welcome to the second act of your career. And it is fire. Ah. I wonder if he'll be able to resist putting himself in the show. I hope, I hope that he does. I kind of like that he's just behind the scenes. He's, he, he's, he's directing the heck out of this and producing it. So those are my top 10 shows of 2022. Uh, be sure to check out the runner-up video as well later today. And we are truly in the new golden age of television. Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today so you don't miss any of these videos, including that follow-up runner-up video. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos that are already up right now.